Okay, um, my name is Jessica Hansen. I'm a sophomore here at the College of Idaho. I'm Camille Thornoy. I'm a senior. And we will be presenting on the size and abundance of holothurians, which are sea cucumbers, on the reef flat of Heron Island in Queensland, Australia, which is where they were just presenting from. So, a little bit of overlap. So, um, I guess most of the information that they covered at the beginning was also what we were planning on doing with the little bit of a summary about the island. So um, as they noted, the, the island is one mile in diameter. Um, it's completely surrounded by a marine reserve coral reef park. Um, uh, the research island or the research station that we stayed at is uh, based out of the University of Queensland and they do a lot of different uh, monitoring projects in the coral reef marine reserve around the island. So there's a lot of projects that have been going on there for many years. And um, as they mentioned before, the back part of the island is a national park that is home to a lot of different species of birds. So um, one of the things that we wanted to bring into our presentation was one of the, some of the importances in, of coral reefs and kind of why it's relevant to really understand these really diverse ecosystems. So um, in the last, last decade or so, there's really been a trend in biology to um, uncover and understand the interconnectedness of ecosystems uh, and different types of organisms, especially on a global scale. Um, as we discovered, and for me personally, one of the things that I really realized was the interconnectedness between nutrient flow of uh, rainforests and coral reefs. So uh, coral reefs are really important, especially for individuals living um, on uh, shorelines for as a source of food, medicine, and income, especially um, in developing nations where people uh, base most of their livelihood on fishing sources and things like that. So um, one of the important things to realize is why they're, why, how they work so that we can prevent the loss of coral reefs in the future and know exactly the different types of benefits and biodiversity that we would be missing. Okay, so this is an image of where we did our study. Um, it's kind of in that general area. Um, the shipwreck was a fun feature of the island. I don't think it influenced our study though. It's been there for a long time, but it's just kind of fun. Um, so, uh, if you can see, this area in the circle is called the reef flat, and that's where we, we did our study. Um, that's where sea cucumbers are most commonly found, and that's why we chose that area. Um, extending on past that, you have the reef crest, which is where um, the coral reefs are, and um, beyond that, you have the deep water ocean. So, um, as the tides come in, they bring in nutrients from the ocean and the coral reef into the reef flat area. So, uh, oh, good. Some of the role that um, sea cucumbers play in coral reefs is they're known as filter feeders. So, as the detritus, which are different types of nutrients, get washed in with the tide onto the reef flat, one of the um, things that they do is uh, filter feed out different types of waste and um, detritus that is then recycled back into the reef for nutrients that are beneficial to other types of organisms. Um, so, holtharians especially prefer certain types of bacteria and algae, which if uh, sea cucumbers were not residing in the region, would actually build up and create an issue with uh, the coral reefs. The algae would tend to bloom over and completely annihilate different types of habitat in the reef if the filter feeders were not there to take care of the job. And this interest in their differentiation of um, preferred food kind of sparked our interest and um, drove our hypothesis and study. So one of the interesting um, things that we found, so for the biology of a sea cucumber, they're, no, they're found in the phylum Echnodermata, class Holothurioida. There we go. Um, so there were four common types of sea cucumbers that we found in our study. We found um, Holothuria atra, which is also known as the common black sea cucumber, Holothuria edulis, which uh, is named after looking like a burnt sausage. It literally has like a pink underside, like you would find on, you know, a barbecue grill. Um, Psychopus chlorinatus is the greasy, green sea cucumber, and uh, Psychopus variegatus, which is a variegated sea cucumber, and it looks like it's almost been chopped up into pieces. Um, as mentioned earlier, they are filter feeders. They're known as kind of the worms of the ocean floor because they very slowly move through and filter out different types of nutrients. Um, they're also a relative of the sea star. Okay, so one of the questions we were curious about um, 
was the correlation between size of sea cucumbers and their distance from the reef crust where these nutrients are pushing in. So we were thinking maybe sea cucumbers are bigger where there's more nutrients, or maybe there's sort of a competition thing, like the older, you know, more advanced sea cucumbers can compete for the more nutrients. Um, so that was one thing we looked into. Um, we also looked into distribution of the different species, since we did see four of them, to see if there was sort of a competition thing going on. Um, and we also wanted to see what was the most common species, what was, you know, having the biggest impact on recycling these nutrients back into the ecosystem. So for conducting our research, we did a belt transect method. Um, along 70 meters of the beach, we went out um, 50 meters from the lowest tide. And um, we measured in 10 meter sections. And every time we came to a sea cucumber on one meter of each of the belt, we would record the species and the lake. So we did this snorkeling, and it was interesting during the cyclone. But, um, <laughs> So this sort of yeah, for sure. <laughs> it gave us a picture of where the species were and how big they were, and you know their relationship to being near each other. So we found that Holotheria atra was by far the most common sea cucumber. Um, the uh, second most common was was Holotheria um, oh sorry Cyclopus variegatus, um, but we didn't see a significant correlation between sea cucumber size and distribution on the reef flat. Um, this graph shows the distribution of species per 10 meter segment. So this is the closest to the shore and that's the closest to reef crest. Again, there's not a statistically significant difference here. Um, this graph is a little bit more illustrative. Um, here we have Colotheria edulis, and as you can see, they're a lot more common by the reef shore, and as you move out towards the ocean and the reef crest, they become a lot less common. Um, Holotheria atra, the most common one, was pretty even distribution. And then um, Cyclopus chloronatus became a lot more prevalent as you moved out towards the reef crest. And we sort of witnessed that when we were out snorkeling on the reef crest and the fore reef and back reef. Um, they're kind of found out more in the deeper waters. So for our um, discussion, we also looked at some different studies that had been done concerning sea cucumbers and kind of their distribution along various islands that were also found near the uh, island where we stayed in Great Barrier Reef. So one of the studies that we looked at also found Hothoria atra to be the most common species. Um, uh, additionally, a similar study found 92% of Hothoria atra to be the most common species as well. So one of the interesting facts that we found was um, our least common species, S. goddess, and then our most common species, Ultheria atra, have been known to occupy different areas of the reef flat and back reef, or excuse me, reef crest, depending on the substrate. So substrate is also um, known as the types of grains and different types of nutrients that are found in an area where an organism is residing, which can also affect what they eat, and um, how big they become. So one of the interesting things we found was, even though we did not find very many um, varying goddess, uh, the smaller ones were found more towards the uh, front part of the shoreline as opposed to the back part of the reef crest, which were bigger. So we believe that more nutrients perhaps reside further away from the shoreline because the uh, ecosystem is more diverse in those areas. So, um, like I just mentioned, S. goddess was smaller in reef flat areas and larger in deeper waters. Um, Pulthari atra may not follow this same pattern. Mm -hmm. they, um, um, different organisms might follow different distribution patterns. Um, so we think Pulthari atra isn't influenced by these factors. They're pretty much just everywhere on the reef flat. So, um, so future studies, um, they're are a lot of species of um, sea cucumbers that are currently being fished, um, and that's for delicacies and medicine, mostly in China. So they are becoming more and more threatened, um, and it's kind of a weird thing to think about because you wouldn't typically think about yeah. eating a sea cucumber, but they are important and they are being taken out of these ecosystems where they're recycling nutrients. Um, and typically, Holotheria atra isn't fished, but as these more rare and sort of um, desired species are becoming overfished and unavailable, um, fisheries are moving on to Holotheria atra, which is really important to the Heron reef system. 
Yeah, so one of the interesting things um, that we found for our study was because, because the marine reserve around uh, Heron Island is protected, it represents a healthy population size for Holthuri Atra. So in the future, for conducting future research, one thing that would be interesting to do is to use um, kind of a distributional um, just methodology to compare a healthy population size to areas that have experienced fishing populate like populations that have been fished and depleted. So if you were looking to restore healthy populations in areas that were struggling with um, different types of species being fished, um, Heron Island Marine Reserve would be a good place to start with a strong foundation for uh, sea cucumber populations. Questions? Other than humans, um, what are the natural predators for these things? That's the interesting thing. Nothing really eats them except for humans. Um, we experienced this firsthand, but they actually produce a sort of sticky mucus when they're threatened, so if something tried to pick it up and eat it, um, and that sort of tangles things up and would get in a fish's gills if they tried to eat it. Um, I got a little too close to one and it attacked me, and that was <laughs> scary, but... <laughs> it literally regurgitates its insides when it's feeling uh -huh. threatened, and it's a really sticky, spider-webby feeling. Yeah. It took a little while to pick it off her skin, and it was kind of... <laughs> <laughs> How much does it produce of this disease? Um, it's quite a bit it's actually. Lot. It's I very stringy. That. It can it can expand itself out, so wrap itself around. Yeah, <laughs> I, both of my hands were like tied together by this mm -hmm. like yeah. Yeah. Fun, <laughs> fun fact. <laughs> yeah. How does the cyclone affect these mm -hmm. cucumbers? I mean, do they just get completely they tossed around and then redistributed? Or they can casually happen? move very slowly on their own, but for the most part, if there's nutrients and some sort of filter current, they're going to be fine. Um, it doesn't really yeah. affect them that much. It can move them around. They're actually I mean, very, they move kind of with the tide to different areas to feed. And the reef lot, at least on Heron Island, is really protected. So you have the reef crest that's um, sort of absorbing the motion and the shock of the waves. So even though you have this big storm, there isn't a lot of turmoil on the bottom mm -hmm. of the ocean floor where these sea cucumbers are. So it's, it, it might, but it probably doesn't affect their distribution. And the interesting thing too is you have quite a lot of fluctuation with the tide going in and out as well. So they're kind of used to being moved around a little bit as the tide goes in and out, especially with different fluctuations with the moon. Did you have a question? Yeah, in your review of the literature, did you find any examples of coral reefs that have died because of sea cucumbers being gone? Um, not really, but there's an increasing um, like knowledge base that when biodiversity is decreased in coral reefs, the health of the overall leaf um, sort of degrades. Mm -hmm. um, I think sea cucumbers aren't necessarily a super critical keystone species, but they definitely do help with nutrient recycling, which is really critical to um, coral reefs because they're sort of in a nutrient-deprived environment, and coral reefs are an oasis of nutrients. So if you take out a factor that's sort of recycling these nutrients and making sure that they're still there, then um, it has an impact on the amount of fish that can live there and biodiversity.